Thanks for tuning in to the Perry Health Pulse. And today we're going into a little bit of the history, one aspect of history, uh, of hospitals and healthcare, a very important thing that used to happen. First of all, remember that all of our resources for this podcast, for our blogs, um, email newsletter, and such can all be found online. If you go to www.perrymemorial.org slash pulse. And I'm sure all of us at some point in our lives have had some difficulty breathing. For some people, that's a result of things like COPD, and for others, it could be as simple as running a mile and getting winded. But imagine having such difficulty breathing that your entire body has to be put inside of a tube, which then has all the air sucked out of it like a vacuum. It doesn't sound comfortable. It doesn't sound fun at all. And uh, that's what we're going to hear about today, the iron lung. It was an extremely important part of our history, an extremely useful tool, especially in the context of what we were using it against. So that's what we're going to be talking about today. There's actually an iron lung that's going to be on display, uh, an, an iron lung exhibit at the Veterans and Seniors Resource Fair, which is coming up. And we'll talk about that a little bit at the end. So stay tuned till the end of this, and uh, we'll, we'll share some details on how to come and see the iron lung. Now let's get started with the episode. Our guest joining us today is the Director of Respiratory Care at Perry. Uh, his name is Tim Schultz. He's a registered respiratory therapist and has been doing that line of work for more than 30 years, so he's got a lot of experience. Thanks for joining us, Tim. Thanks for having me. When you were going through school, was the iron lung still around? Was that something you were taught about? Um, we, were, we were taught about the history of it, but they weren't really in use per se as far as new new equipment. Actually, there probably were some older patients who still had the device, um, but talking maybe a handful in the U.S. at that time back in the 80s. So, Can you actually back up for a second and let's talk about what was the iron lung? What was it actually used for? Sure, sure. The iron lung was developed as a treatment for respiratory muscle weakness and paralysis, mainly due to the polio virus. Uh, in back in uh, the early 1900s, polio was really a big deal in this country. In uh, 1952, there were about 58,000 cases diagnosed in the U.S., and 3,000 died from that. So not that long ago. Some physicians, uh, due to the reason why people died from polio was uh, it would attack their respiratory muscles, their diaphragm, and the things that help them to, to be able to take deep breaths and breathe. So as those, as that paralysis occurred and people would breathe more shallowly, it was ineffective and they basically would suffocate. So they developed the iron lung. It was developed by a couple of physicians in, uh, in 1927 and it was really put into use more widespread in 1929. They used uh, vacuums to hook up to this chamber that a patient was placed in And pretty much their entire body was placed in this chamber with the exception of their head. So they would apply this negative pressure to this chamber, and that would, in fact, make their chest expand, and it would draw air into their lungs through the use of this negative pressure. Pretty uh, wild stuff for back in that day. It almost sounds like someone being in space, but they've only got the helmet on and not the rest of the suit. Right. That does not sound comfortable at all. Was it considered safe? It, it, it actually was, and it saved many thousands of people uh, who otherwise would have perished due to, you know, not, not breathing. It works in a little different way than, than, you know, what we would use in modern day for similar problems. The iron lung really, we had mentioned it really wasn't in use back in the 80s, except for maybe a handful of people. After that, uh, for some other neuromuscular problems with, with muscle respiratory muscle weakness, they used a, uh, a device called a chest cuirass, which was basically a, a cut-down iron lung that only encompassed the chest of the patient. And they found that that worked well as well. The reason why it was able to work is most of these patients um, didn't really have any pulmonary issues. The problem was just muscle weakness. So they didn't have any issues with congestion or bronchospasm or things that would not allow them to fill their lungs adequately. 
So uh, people that we have on ventilators today, if they have emphysema, bronchitis, things like that, this sort of device would not work effectively for them at all. And, and so that's why in later years they develop different, different ways to, to ventilate people. Well, just to make sure I understand, so this is polio would just attack the lungs and weaken them so much that you didn't have the strength to breathe. Is Correct. That right? Yeah, it, it attacked really all the muscles in the in the body, and the thing that made the development of this iron lung so key is that these patients could be saved, and and many times this paralysis would back off to where maybe after a few weeks of treatment in the iron lung, a lot of these people were able to get out. They may still have some weakness, but they can. Many of them could still ambulate around. Um, it, it wasn't a permanent thing for all of them. Now, some people, the the paralysis was permanent, but in either case, this allowed these patients to survive, and for many of them, it allowed them to live basically normal lives. So you said it's uh, it's not a permanent thing for most of them. So, did the iron lung actually help people strengthen? enough that they could overcome it or is it a matter of the polio had to be addressed and once that was addressed then they could get off of it basically the polio had to to run its course and as long as it didn't do enough permanent damage that the patients could recoup that muscle um, following the the polio Uh, normally with time as that as the body's defenses took care of things and and the polio the virus load went down they as i said they were able to gain some strength back the lung still helped them because it it made them breathe more effectively but then they could trial times outside of the lung start to develop their own muscle strength back because the respiratory muscles like any other muscle in the body if not used they'll atrophy or they'll weaken It, it it was a long road for a lot of these polio patients to to get back to to even, you know, being able to wheelchair around. You know, some of these people had uh, permanent permanent damage to their muscles that did not allow them to have a normal, per se, life. So is the iron lung used for any other sort of respiratory issues, or is it pretty much only for the polio? Um, polio, uh, it could have been used for uh, other uh, neuromuscular problems where respiratory muscle weakness or paralysis would be would come into play Uh, maybe some of your uh, muscular dystrophy type of things conditions where respiratory muscle weakness is is the problem so it's not really anymore that that type of therapy would not be a therapy of choice for much of anything Uh, there are newer alternative devices that can be used well, and speaking of that, can you describe a little bit of what technology and methods are used now for respiratory problems? I realize polio is not really a concern anymore, but sure. other types of things that might need to be addressed. Yeah, thank goodness. Uh, you know, Jonas Salk, when he developed the polio vaccine, it pretty much eradicated it. Uh, I was doing a little research. There's still a handful of cases worldwide, maybe some countries that, that don't vaccinate. The problem now is with people not vaccinating in our own country, you know, if they travel, it still could be an issue. So that's why it's real important. When they developed the oral vaccine for polio, that was the best thing they ever did, and it's so easy. There's no reason not to, not to do that. So nowadays, there's a couple of different options uh, for ventilating patients. We have uh, what's called a, uh, a critical care ventilator. These are the sorts of things that are used when when patients are really ill, and it requires a tube to be placed into their trachea, and they're placed on this ventilator, which is tubings hooked up to a machine, and it provides a positive pressure that inflates the lungs that way, as opposed to the, the lung where it created a negative pressure and filled the lungs. This is actually forcing air into the lungs. These are in use Postoperatively, they're they're used for patients of all sorts of uh, of uh, pulmonary problems, uh, multiple traumas, uh, patients with uh, COPD, all these sorts of things. And the thing about them is, 
everything can be set exactly. You can set the exact amount of, of air that goes in each breath, the percentage of oxygen. We can add extra pressure to improve oxygenation. And everything is very easily controlled. Uh, the, the setback to that is it's, it's obviously very uncomfortable to have a tube down your throat. Uh, most of these patients need to, need to be restrained because it, it's a natural tendency to, if there's something in your throat, you want to pull it out. <laughs> so it, when people are awake and alert, that's fine. You can tell them not to and they won't. But if they doze off, they're, they're going to try to pull that tube out of there. So that, that is the, the most invasive form of treatment that we have for ventilating patients who are unable to, to ventilate and oxygenate on their own. There are other devices that are more non-invasive where we can use a mask and provide positive pressure uh, to fill patients' lungs and to, to ventilate for them. And in fact, nowadays, for the type of neuromuscular problems and muscular weakness that people would have with polio, uh, we would use one of these non-invasive type, uh, uh, commonly known as a BiPAP mask. And basically that provides a couple of levels of pressure to inflate the lungs so that these patients can remain breathing on their own. They're just getting a boost from this machine. And that helps them to not go to the next level and need to have that tube placed in their trachea and be really uncomfortable. Well, in either way, it sounds like instead of the old way of creating, uh, of taking away the pressure from around the body, it's about going more directly to the lungs to do that, to create a positive pressure instead. So Correct. that seems like it's a nice change and probably only possible because of um, increased safety with sterilization and... right. And being able to have smaller technology and devices too. Absolutely, absolutely. These these types of equipment get smaller every time there's a new generation, and it's it's great because a lot of patients are able to utilize equipment like that at their home. So rather than have you know needing to to be hospitalized for extended periods of times, they can, they can be taken care of at home where they're more comfortable. Absolutely, and best of all polio being gone we don't have to worry about people being in iron lungs or anything like that anymore now you can just go and and observe it and remember the history of it and it was an amazing device to have had absolutely it 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 provided life for so many people in this country back in the early 19 early to mid 1900s so great device and great information thanks so much tim you're very welcome thank you Well, that wraps up our episode about the Iron Lung, but I want to take a little bit of time to talk about the event coming up where you can come and observe the Iron Lung and uh, learn a little bit more about it, see it in person of what it actually looked like. On July 24th, it's a Wednesday, Perry is co-hosting an event with Representative Dan Swanson from Illinois. He's a state representative looking to bring resources to seniors and veterans. So it is a resource fair for seniors, veterans, their family members, Really, anyone who has the time to come out and learn a little bit, uh, communicate a little bit with members from agencies and organizations who can share what's available and how to access those things. Because those are the two things that people struggle with the most, is being aware of what's out there and being aware of how to get started with it or what applications need to be submitted. So everything from senior living and taxes to employment assistance and to state and local programs that are available for financial assistance, transportation, things of that nature. There's going to be a big section from Perry with various departments, including presentations from some of our providers about some of those chronic conditions that uh, people might struggle with later in life and how to cope with those and manage those. And then in addition, thanks to the Princeton Rotary Club, we will have the Iron Lug exhibit. So that'll be a great thing for people of all ages to come and see because, uh, like Tim said, even in the 80s, only a handful of people really were using those. It's not something that most people who are alive right now have seen that much or are that familiar with. So everyone has something they can gain from that. The resource fair is going to be on July 24th, Wednesday, from 3 p.m. until 7 p.m. It's going to include more than 30 vendors all set up at the Bureau County Metro Center in Princeton. And you can get more information about that uh, by going to this podcast webpage, www.perrymemorial.org slash pulse. 
you can find this episode. You can find the details about this event and come in. It's completely free and going to be a great time to learn and educate yourself and family members. Thanks for tuning into The Pulse.